Hello, I'm John Chivaco, the co-chair of the NIGEO 2023 conference and a board member of the New York Geothermal Energy Organization. I'd like to welcome you to this recording of a live presentation from the conference, a two-day event which was held in Albany, New York on April 26th and 27th of 2023. This year's educational sessions and keynotes represent the latest in ground source heat pump system design, product innovations, and installation practices, along with important policy, regulatory, financing, and incentive updates. This presentation is one of over 40 sessions from the two-day event, all of which were recorded and available at NIGEO's website, www.ny-geo.org, along with session descriptions and a link to download the slides from each of the sessions presented. NIGEO is proud to make this content available to our members and other industry stakeholders. And if you are a member, thanks so much for your support and participation. If you find this content valuable and for some odd reason, you are not yet a member, consider joining NIGEO at the appropriate membership level with details available at our website. The live recording from the NIGEO 2023 conference will start in just a moment. Thanks so much for listening. Hi, please take a seat in the back. Okay. Um, welcome to the policy and people panel. This is where we're going to talk about um, how bringing people from very different backgrounds together is how we create and we pass great policy. So my name is Ania Camargo. I am the Thermal Networks Manager at the BDC. The BDC is the Building Decarbonization Coalition. And uh, our goal is to bring people together from different backgrounds to electrify the building sector. And we do that through research and policy and market transformation um, and consumer inspiration. So we have two goals for this session. The first goal is to, um, our fabulous panel is gonna introduce themselves, but they're also gonna talk about who are the people and the roles of types of people that they work with to achieve their goals. So that's the people part. After that round, we're gonna have a second round in which we were, are going to uh, together do a policy workshop. We're gonna come up with the priorities that we all have jointly. And then the third round or chapter of this will be a success story that brings policy and people together to basically get really important policy over the finish line. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with Debbie New. If you could introduce yourself, talk about your organization and the people you work with, that would be great. Are we good? Okay, uh, so my name is Debbie New and I grew up in Vermont, but I learned my organizing in Massachusetts. Well, wait, I have to, I have to revise that. Um, I'm living in Vermont now, and I've started with Sally, who's here with me, uh, the Vermont Community Geothermal Alliance, and we're advancing what to many in Vermont is a new idea, which is that you can harness and share heat, but it's obviously not a new idea. So when I think about how I ended up working with the people I'm working with now, I would say it kind of started back when I did live in Vermont, and I choreographed a lot of high school musicals. And I don't know if they're musical theater fans in the room or not, but um, yeah, so you know how many people it takes to put on a show, right? Especially in high school, you've got a lot of people who never knew this stuff before, never have never been on stage, but you've got to break down the, the steps for them and get everybody moving in the right direction, in the same direction. Well, the same proved true when I organized in Massachusetts, mainly about gas leaks with some people who are in this room who are now focused on thermal networks. So in that case, we had scientists, we had municipalities involved, a lot of people doing research, we had policy people, we had economists, and we also had moms. So, um, and I, I imagine you know that moms are amazing at organizing, right? So that's another foundation. But um, when I came to, back to Vermont and realized that people were not talking about thermal networks there, they understood geothermal pretty well, but people weren't talking about 
putting these systems together and sharing heat. I mean, heat is such a precious resource in Vermont, so let's do it. So I started pulling people together and I started with a lawyer, which uh, was a bit foreign to me, but um, we needed to write a policy to allow this to happen in our state. And I knew from Massachusetts and New York that we needed a good bill. So we started with the New York bill. We also have an economist who was working on gas leaks and still is working on gas leaks, but also wanted to join me in working on a solution. We've been fighting gas issues and methane emission issues for so long that it was really easy to get people on board talking about what can we actually build together. So a lawyer and an economist. We also have people from Efficiency Vermont our efficiency utility, we have electric utilities and our gas utility working together on our team. We also have communities. We have regional planning commissions. These are people who work with many municipalities at the same time. They understand the culture on the ground. They understand what towns need, what towns are not set up well to do, and what kind of help they need. We also have finance people, and this is really important. We have the Vermont Economic Development Authority and the Vermont Bond Bank. So they're right now pretty much sitting around waiting for a project and we're trying to give them a project, but they are learning with us all about these systems and what we need in order to make them happen in Vermont. So those are the people that we're enlisting and inviting more people in, breaking things down for people and trying to get everybody moving in the same direction. So I'm, I'm trying to understand why. That was awesome. Thank you. So we're gonna go to Brian, but I'm, I'm hoping. I was hoping to have this um, live. Um, okay. So Carrie, <laughs> all of those people. Can you remember all those people? The lawyers, and the finance folks. Economic development. Economic development. So, so yeah, Brian, if you could just go from there, that would be great. Okay. Hi, my name is Bryant Jones. I'm with Geothermal Rising. Uh, we are a community organizer for the geothermal industry. Um, I have a background in energy policy. I'm not an engineer or a geologist. Um, where I just finished up my PhD and what I focused on was uh, in, the, in the clean energy transition, why are there, why do some energy technologies remain stagnant? And I didn't look at it from an economic or technical perspective because those are well researched. I looked at it from a social, from policy, from collective action and organizational structure perspectives to see why some energy technologies remain stagnant. And it just so happened that geothermal was one of those, one of my case studies in my research because as we all know, it's less than 1% of our thermal energy and less than half a percent of our uh, electricity in the United States, but yet it's a mature, proven technology. It's been around for 130 some years in Boise, Idaho, with a district heating system, um, and we've been producing electricity in the United States since 1960, since the 1960s, and in Italy since 1904 when we first powered the, our first five. Light, the light bulb, five light bulbs with uh, electricity in, in, in Tuscany and in Italy. Uh, so this proven uh, mature technology, why is it still a nascent technology? Uh, and so one of my findings of my research, and thank you to many of you in the room who helped me with this research, um, was came down to uh, community. And that has always been something that's been really important to me and and is how communities but create momentum and empower whether empower whether it's a municipality and, and making change within a community or whether it's an, an industry community and trying to grow the, their and, and commercialize the technology. So uh, that is that's sort of a little bit about my background and, and geothermal rising is is trying to align the geothermal community so that we can raise the profile of all geothermal technologies um, that for all the different segments and through that get more agenda, no more policy time with uh, with policymakers. So that's a little bit about me. Great. Thanks. Um, so I'm Heather Deese. I head up policy and regulatory affairs for Dandelion Energy. Um, Dandelion is a residential um, geothermal installation company. 
So we recently surpassed our uh, 1300th um, home that we've installed geothermal in um, since our founding in New York six years ago. We work in New York State, uh, Connecticut, and Massachusetts today. Um, we're going to be starting to install systems in Colorado later this year, and um, we're looking at Maryland as a, as a next potential market soon thereafter, New Jersey, Minnesota, Michigan, Illinois, lots of places on the radar. So from a policy perspective in terms of how we work um, as a company and, and how I work as a person, um, I was just thinking about um, talking with, with Zainab and Audrey and the, the networked geothermal. Um, I do my work through networking, um, understanding you know how many people there are out there with so many different interests that align um, with our particular technology. Um, we get policy work done by partnering with industry partners, which means all of the geothermal companies that are installing heating and cooling systems for large commercial buildings where we're doing residential. So we want to be, you know, side by side and, and arm in arm with them. Um, groups like NYGO are our board of the, I'm a proud board member of NYGO and, and our board really represents that spectrum across the types of installation companies and different types of drilling contractors and HVAC installer contractors. We do, we do both of those as a company. My background personally um, is in having started in marine science. I have a PhD in ocean physics, which is a random fact in the geothermal industry. Um, but the um, sort of ability to look at environmental solutions from a private sector uh, academia, government, nonprofits. Uh, I've worked in all those different types of entities, and so I really like to work with people from all those different types of entities. Um, we have found the electrification and, and more broadly the environmental NGOs to be just incredible partners um, for the, the last year and a half since I came on board with Dandelion. We've developed um, all kinds of relationships with national you know environmental defense club sierra club the sort of more traditional environmental ngos um through rewiring and bdc and just incredible work that the the third sector is getting done and that's so powerful from a policy perspective when you can walk into a congressional delegation office and say we've got an electrification nonprofit and an environmental ngo and we're here as a private sector business entity and we all want this thing to happen together um, that's pretty amazing. Another group that's been really important for us is technical colleges. So we work really closely with the schools that are educating folks, particularly for HVAC installer training. Um, and we've had just really good luck being able to talk with our state level legislators and, um, and DECD type economic development agencies and ICERTA about what are the partnerships that are needed to be able to get students trained um, and ready to, to come into the workforce um, at a company like ours. So that, that type of entity and the folks who are like HVAC, installation, technical college professors are like the unsung heroes of, of our industry. I mean, people who are just working so hard to, to try to get those heat pump technologies to have space within fossil fuel dominated curriculum for their students. Um, so that's been really important to you. And then I would just say in terms of our ability to get FaceTime um, and, and get like Department of Energy and the EPA Energy Star program and all of the congressional offices to pay attention to us, the Geo Exchange has been amazingly important. Um, I think being able to, to show up and say like, this is what all of the manufacturers are, are looking at and thinking about this is what you know we as an installer are worried about and sort of where do those come together the the piece that I would say we're still really struggling with is like now that we have all these amazing incentives that we've heard about all day today from the IRA the actual installation process and getting people on board and hiring we're hiring like 10 people a week right now at Dandelion we cannot find enough people with licenses or enough people with the educational background that they can move through the licensing program is a huge issue. We need more of those technical college supports. Um, and we are having huge issues now with permitting. So now that we have so many customers, the incentives look so good, and everybody wants to buy these systems, and the permitting process is really slowing us up. I'm going to wrap it up. <laughs>
hand it over to Ryan. <laughs> no, that we, we also want to spend time on, po on, po on policy. So go ahead. Yeah. Right, thank you. That, uh, Heather, it is such a pleasure to work with you and Doug. Uh, Rory Christian, I said it earlier today, last night. I'm going to get this on a T-shirt and maybe I'll sell them. Uh, persistence, drive, focus. I mean, the work that you've accomplished and the our ability to partner with you on a lot of different in a lot of different instances has been really rewarding and great. So, um, thank you for that. And uh, I'm Ryan Dougherty with Geo Exchange. Uh, we're a nonprofit trade group um, representing the industry in Washington, D.C. and around the country. Uh, our historic focus has primarily been at the federal level. And I talked earlier today about um, all of the legwork that went into building a coalition of support within Congress. And it, it's actually, it's, it can be very frustrating. People talk, say all the time, well, oh, gosh, how do you work with Congress? It must be so dispiriting. Um, you know, to, to play in the swamp and, and to, to play the politics game. But working in the geothermal heat pump industry is a bit of a joy um, in that regard because every office you go into, they pretty much like you, regardless of their political bent, um, of their ideology. They can be sort of rabid uh, red state Republicans or the most dyed in the wool. Um, environmentally conscious uh, democratic offices, and they like geothermal for different reasons. It's very rare to find any type of industry or technology that really appeals to so many people for such a wide array of reasons. So I, we're, we're blessed in that regard. Um, I think the fellow panelists have, have really enunciated uh, a lot of the key stakeholders and, and people that we're aiming at. Uh, for so long, our, our focus has been on elected officials, you know, their staffs, uh, regulators, executive agency people, but it's, it's such a broader um, array of what I'll call gatekeepers. These are the people that in many ways hold the key to our future and to our fortunes as an industry. And they, you know, the message we're delivering them to them is all fairly similar. We, all, we know all of the key aspects uh, about the benefits of geothermal heating and cooling, but we kind of have to tailor our message a little specifically to their uh, perspective and their prerogative. So whether it's, you know, a facilities manager or um, um, a school principal, an architecture firm, an, an engineering firm, um, they always have uh, preconceptions about geothermal, about what it is, what it does, how it works, and maybe how it doesn't. And, and really, I think our goal for the next uh, 10 years and more is to educate these individuals and really show them the power and the potential and the diverse array of uh, impacts and benefits that the, that the technology has. Um, I think somebody mentioned academia. And uh, I went to the University of Illinois. I was uh, there just a few weeks ago uh, because I had heard Dr. Liu, uh, Zhao Bing Liu from Oak Ridge National Lab was going to inspect his uh, thermal energy uh, battery. And uh, so I, I jumped in the car and I, I went over to see him. And it's amazing to me that the University of Illinois, and this is happening in other places, is really becoming a center of excellence around geothermal. They're doing all sorts of uh, really neat uh, research projects. Uh, they're, mon they're installing these systems in campus facilities and then monitoring them. And um, it's really great to see academia um, rise up and, and focus on us, uh, the technology in that way. I was so jazzed to see Jamal Lewis here. And it's because of Heather. Um, the, Jamal Lewis is with Rewiring America, a really fantastic organization. Um, and the work that Dandelion has done getting folks like um, BDC and Rewiring and Sierra Club and so many others really committed to our cause. I'm entirely grateful for that. Um, I think I'll stop there and uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Marshall. I'm the Director of Organizing and Advocacy for New Yorkers for Clean Power. And one of the um, most important pieces of the work that I do is helping to coordinate an amazing New York State campaign called Renewable Heat Now. Um, we have been working for many years now to advocate for um, good uh, policy to 
perpetuate heat pumps, and um, we've been very excited to work on the uh, community geo or thermal network piece for, for a long time as well. Um, so basically, all that what that means is I do two things. I get to know a lot of people, and, and then I nag them. So that's my, my main job. And um, I just, whenever I'm not sure how to do that, I just picture my deceased Jewish grandmother on my shoulder, and she guides me. So, um, and works pretty well. So, <laughs> uh, so um, you know, the previous panelists mentioned a lot of the people. I'll just say I was one of those mothers. That's how I know Ania. That's how I know Debbie. That's how I know Zainab. That's how I know Audrey. Um, and that's how I, I cut my teeth as a when I was a new organizer um, with my first organizing job at Mothers Out Front, and that and that role at first we were fighting um, the supply side, um, the gas infrastructure expansion in New York, including in my very own town. Um, and that was the first time in my life, so I'd always been concerned about climate change. I studied uh, geology. I have a couple degrees in geology, and um, so I just love geothermal. I also lived in Iceland with the other kind of geothermal, so I'm just all about geo all the time. And um, where was I going with this? Oh, and so then, you know, going from fighting the um, gas spread of gas infrastructure, you know, met these amazing moms and started to focus on the solution side and the people side. And um, it's just been a really great pleasure to go from that kind of organizing to directing the Heat Smart Tompkins program, where I worked individually with homeowners, I worked with contractors, I worked with municipal leaders. Um, from every side of the aisle, Ryan would be very proud of me. Um, <clears throat> New York State has a program called the Clean Energy Communities and um, where municipalities can earn points by taking certain actions. And there is a clean heat um, action that you can take. And I'm happy to say that every municipality that invited, that I got to speak to and propose that we work together on this, 100% of every town board of red, or blue or mixed voted unanimously to work with me on a clean heat program um, in my area. So, um, you know, basically it's because I can talk to anybody and nag them. Um, <laughs> my children are very embarrassed by this, but <laughs> it works for me. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I will just say one more um, important stakeholder that wasn't mentioned in addition to the lawyers and the experts and the policy people and the advocates and the econ economists and the academics is the contractors. You have to talk to the contractors. You have to understand the contractors. You have to advocate for the contractors and you have to listen to the contractors because we can have all the best ideas in the entire world and if they can't do it or it isn't gonna work for them to do it, they're not gonna do it. So um, I just wanted to add contractors to that and I'll wrap up by saying that um, that also planners um, are really important advocates and, um, and people that you want to be talking to. So I'll just I'll leave it there. Perfect. And I'm going to put on my heat hat and um, add to the people to work with. <laughs> and add uh, gas utilities to the list and add uh, labor to the list. And it, so we have two pages of people we have to collaborate to get this done. So it's a big task. So now we're going to find out what's, we're going to work with all of these people to get important policies passed. I asked everybody to come up with three priorities. And given that we don't have a ton of time, I'm going to only have you talk about two of them. <laughs> so, but here's the way we're going to do this. I will again start with Debbie. And that I don't want to end up with 10, if you each gave two, I don't want to end up with 10 priorities. I want to end up with fewer than 10 priorities. So if you can build on something that's already on there, you can say, you know, I, I love that priority, but you'd have to add. Um, and then if there's something that's on your priority list that is completely missed, then we can add it to the bottom. But if it's somehow related, um, and here's the thing also, since, since you won't be able to see the screen, if you have to, you may have to come down when you're, when you're looking at your priorities. But th the idea is that we want to come up with what's that list of top priorities. Um, so each one of you listing the priorities is not going to work. It's really about what, which priorities do we have in common. 
and which priorities can we leave with here and be excited to go do together. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Debbie. And um, Carrie, thank you to Carrie from HEAT who is helping me here. And so now I have to go with, and they can be state or federal. And if, if, if they're both state and federal, that's fine, say it. If it's just state or federal, then um, you know, just point it out because then Carrie can write that up on the board. Okay. So go ahead, Debbie. OK, so first priority uh, is to allow communities to implement these systems. The New York bill requires utilities to do it. In Vermont, our bill would allow communities, and that's going to mean different things in different places based on what town charters or uh, town local laws allow. That's number one. Okay. Number two is jobs. And I would say it's not just the labor, usual labor standards, because those are also going to be different in different places in Vermont. There aren't enough plumbers who are unionized to get the work done. So um, we can't require the same things that New York does, but we can require money for workforce development, and we can re require some prevailing wage. So both of those things. Perfect. Right. So, so now your job is to say there's two of them up there. Are are those anywhere near what your list includes? Yes. OK. Do, can you add to those or, or just? Uh, I would add to number two for jobs. It's about community college support okay, and getting. One sec. With in, in red, Carrie, please. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So as a, as a technical industry that needs a lot of technical uh, positions, engineers, drillers, rig operators, we often see that there's not enough community college support or programming or curriculum. Um, and so grant funding at state levels and the federal level to build out geothermal curriculums at community colleges would, uh, is something that, that we were working on a lot. Perfect. And, um, and a second priority, if it's not Debbie's yeah. first priority? Um, it's uh, deployment dollars. So the Department of Energy often thinks of geothermal as a new technology or wait, wait so carrie sorry that's a like separate idea and in black <laughs> thank you <laughs> sorry we, we're doing this live so everybody can see it we were going to do it on that little flip chart and decided that um that she can type really fast so here we are okay deployment dollars yeah Go ahead. deployment and demonstration dollars so as you all know the geothermal technologies office has got about a 250 million dollar budget when the office of nuclear energy has a 3 million billion dollar budget and the office of clean of uh, clean energy demonstration has a 20 billion dollar budget um, we need the department of energy and this is where congress can help uh, is to raise the profile of geothermal within the department of energy but also other agencies department of ag department of the interior and department of commerce economic development rural development all of those programs need to be more aware of geothermal so they can create grant programs for local municipalities to partner with geothermal. So that's, uh, that's my second. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So now, Heather, can do, do any of these make it up on your list? Yeah, number two. Jobs. OK. So we're going back up to jobs, Carrie. <laughs> yeah, thanks. OK. Um, so very specifically, as a contractor, which Lisa told you all, you all have to listen to me because I'm a contractor. <laughs> um, <laughs> We, Dandelion is currently 265 employees and 175 of us are, not us, of our employees are field ops. I'm not a field ops person. But those 175 people are, um, are drillers, trenching, CDL heavy equipment, electricians, plumbing, HVAC installers, AeroSeal installers. And they are hamstrung in their ability to be able to move to different parts of our operations because if you hold a license in Massachusetts, you can't go to Connecticut, or if you hold a license in Connecticut, you can't go to New York. We currently would be operating and, and offering services to customers in New Jersey, but none of our New York or Connecticut folks can work in New Jersey. There's a huge state-to-state -state protective licensing issue that is holding back our industry and our individuals and our company today. There is a requirement for HVAC installer licenses in Connecticut that means that if you do not have on the job fossil fuel equipment experience, you cannot move up from an apprentice to a journey license or a journey to a master license. You have to work with fossil fuel equipment. If you just work with heat pumps, like if you work at Dandelion, you can't move up. 
So there are huge, very specific. So, so remove barriers? Licensing <laughs> issues. Yeah. And, and I just hear a lot in policy circles about like, we need more money for workforce. In a lot of instances, we don't need more money for workforce. We need to have more flexible ability to hire people and have people be able to move up through a company. And it's really tactical. And I just feel like often in conversations in rooms like this, that there's a lot of like, let's throw money at workforce with nope. no specificity around what that means. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of nuts and bolts there. My other issue. Yeah. Is, um, that, is that a number four? Or it would be a number four. Okay. I, I'm very torn because I would love to add to number three, but I just number four for me yeah. is permitting. Okay. Permitting. Okay. Permitting is also very local, um, you know, municipality to municipality, county to county, state to state. It's incredibly paperwork intense. Mm -hmm. It it requires entire people. I, I think we have a team of four people at Dandelion who apply for permits all day, every day. And then they run into issues and then they have to go in person. Some of our HGs require wet signatures from homeowners in front of a notary public for a permit application. So streamlining. I mean, please, digital <laughs> age. Get rid I know of we're red New tape. England. <laughs> I know we like to do everything the old fashioned way. I grew, so, up, I grew up here. No more red tape, okay. Yeah, perfect. All right. This thing on? Okay. Uh, well, uh, this isn't a new one, but just to illustrate Heather's point, in, in Illinois, where I live, there's 102 counties in the state, and each county has their own discretion on the permit process and the inspection and approval process uh, for installation of a ground heat exchanger. So, so is there anything you'd like to add to Heather's permitting? No, she, she summed That's, it up. That was um, good. Okay, so, so is, there, is there any other on here that you're willing to contribute to? Or are you I've adding? got a couple new ones. Um, <laughs> I mean, like workforce, workforce was my number one, okay, but I think so, it's been pretty okay. well covered and, right. and e even better enunciated uh, okay. by Heather in terms of some of the complexities there. Um, I will say utility policy is a big one. And I think in New York State, you are really the exception to the rule. In so many states, um, they are tied. So I'm just going to, so can I add that to the first one, that it's um, utility and communities can provide yeah, yeah, thermal I think networks? That, uh, sure. So well, I don't, we I, well, I don't want to, I don't want to pigeonhole this in just thermal networks because um, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about uh, utility energy efficiency programs and how those are are managed. Uh, in the non-pipeline alternatives session earlier, there was some discussion about um, the, uh, the gas side of a dual fuel utility's inability to incentivize customers to switch to electric electricity for heating. This is what's known as a fuel switch prohibition, and there's a lot of uh, states in the nation that really don't allow this sort of cross-subsidization. There are uh, these things called technical reference manuals, which often dictate the uh, ways programs can be set up. Many of these policies and uh, procedures were crafted without us ever being at the table. There are often a lot of false assumptions about how geothermal systems work or don't. And as an industry, we just have a lot of work to do in, in getting utilities to understand uh, properly how geothermal works and how to build their programs around it so so but you're saying that from a policy perspective because that's an education perspective policy perspective is utility reform so that yes. they have more flexibility to electrify yes okay thank Great. you Ania. <laughs> all right and then uh, and number six yeah i would also say awareness and i don't know if we want to just say consumer awareness i think that's an, an issue unto itself uh, but that from so a policy perspective um, yeah, I think that in many ways that policy can drive awareness. Mm -hmm. oh, um, mm -hmm. I think that if you're talking about market development and deployment, the policy can really can oft, the policies can often drive okay. uh, the level of uh, support and engagement with uh, adopters or stakeholders. Perfect. Um, and so that would probably though apply to all of these, right? True. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I plus one to everything everybody already said, and Ryan took my top one, which is utility um, <clears throat> policy. And, and I will specifically say, um, one case, I um, made a relationship, I convinced that person to have a house party, 
I happened to know she lived at the end of the gas line in a gas-constrained area. So she invited her neighbors over, and then I said, hey, why don't we see if we can do a community geo-loop here? And then I talked to a contractor, and then they got it approved by the utility, and they can't get, the contractor can't get the right-of-way to lay the loop. So we have this you know, state that says they want to build these things, they, this was approved, but we still, we can put wires in the street and gas pipes in the street and sewer lines in the street, but we can't put some water in the street. So, so <laughs> that would probably... So, so working yeah. out sort of the public works aspects of this. That's right, and we have a public service law in, in this state that is currently acting as a barrier to move forward with utility deployment of community geo, and that's just a, a huge problem um, that we are working very hard to try to solve right now. <laughs> so, um, and then um, y'all should talk to me because we are doing workforce um, events, and one thing I'll add to the workforce piece. We're going back that, up to workforce. <laughs> yeah, is um, really being realistic about overcoming barriers to bringing um, a, a huge diversity of, of people into these trades. Um, and those, those barriers are on both sides, both the target populations that we'd like to bring into these trades and on the um, employers, employer side, whether it's the private sector or the unions, et cetera. Um, and both sides need to really get real about the barriers and, and the ways to overcome those barriers to, to solve these em employment issues. So that's Good. my, that's all, add that. Super, thank you so much. So so we're really fortunate because we have some incredible people in the audience and so I'm gonna pick on two of them. Um, and I think one of them is still here. Well, I'm gonna start with Ed Graves. Uh, sorry? Draves. Draves, <laughs> we just met. Um, and he works here uh, with UA, a union, and, and I'm just gonna ask you, in looking at this list, uh, it, every, many people had jobs here as a priority and so I would love to hear from you sort of does this make sense to you is there something that you would want to add is there something that you'd want people to understand well I think the first thing that people need to understand um, is when you're looking at all these things the workforce is important everybody talks about the workforce the UA mm -hmm. pipe trades which is plumbers steam fitters, uh, sprinkler fitters. Um, in New York State, we have 24,000 members. Um, and those members have been concentrated in the fossil fuel industry and nuclear. We build powerhouses, we um, do boilers, we do all of that work. And so when people talked about fossil fuel bans, that threatened the livelihood of our members um, because that's where, they've been, that's where they've been employed. But we work with pipe. We do HVAC. Um, so the Jay Egg, who's sitting right here, came to our executive board two years ago and did his demonstration with his chart. And I was in the back. I'm the lobbyist for the union. And Jay did his presentation. And I said, that's, yeah, this is, that's good I, I, I said Buck Rogers, and all my friends make fun of me. He says, play Star Wars. I thought this couldn't happen. But Jay was very convincing. And the board bought into it. And John Murphy, who's our international rep here, um, is a real visionary and saw where this could go. And we need a pathway to the future for all of those workers who have committed their so, lives to the fossil fuel so industry. So Kerry, can we put add that to the job? This is sort of a pathway for and existing gas workers and steel workers so, and right. uh, so, pipe fitters and so everyone I say, else. So like Heather talks about the need for workers, we have 24,000 workers in New York State who are trained to do this work who are ready to do this work, who want to do this work, and we need to bring those folks into this industry um, so that we can grow together, and it's about growing together. Um, and that's what we're excited about. And when you talk about talking about congressional representatives and uh, representatives um, at the state level, the labor movement has great ties to those representatives but we, have, we work to help those industries where we're, where we're being employed. And right, we need a plan. Yeah, yeah. and we All need right. a plan. Okay, right. super, thank you yeah. so much. All right, so that's a, a really 
fun to have an expert in the room when we're talking about jobs. So um, now I'm going to turn to another person who has a very different, I mean, not a different perspective, may have similar opinions, but different perspective, which is from the gas utilities. So I asked Holly, Holly, if you don't mind, um, I just I, I'm curious also, like when we're talking about uh, utility reform, what what you think from a gas utility would make sense? Yeah. Uh, hello. Thank you, Holly Brown, Northwest Natural. So we're way out west, Portland, Oregon. Um, so definitely, the utility reform would be one that uh, shows up as a priority for us. We are regulated to deliver natural gas. We're not a thermal energy company in Portland, at least still. Um, so I think you can do some things in the pilot space. I remember Nikki and I having this conversation way back that you wouldn't necessarily be allowed to do at scale if you're still regulated one way and you're now trying to do something different than your regulation. Um, another piece to this is that uh, we're really good at following the rules and working within constraints, and our constraint is to deliver least cost, least risk resource. And so unless you change some other parameters, um, and the parameters are changing, natural gas has been that least cost, least risk. There's not a lot of room for creativity. So parameters need to change in order for us to come up with the more creative solution. So now if it's you know, renewable thermal, Okay, fine, then we can come up with renewable thermal. So I think there's a lot in this space, but I would say actually um, at least as higher priority of that is the jobs because we can do pilots, but in order to take this to scale, which we know we'll need to do in order to make the difference that is really required, um, we need to have all those jobs or it just stays in a smaller scale pilot form. Yeah, thank you. That's thank you really for putting this great together. Perspective. Um, I, okay, so now we have maybe a couple minutes to ask anyone in the audience if they believe that there is a really important priority that has not made it up onto this list in terms of us furthering sort of geothermal and thermal networks going forward. Is there something that we are missing that is really important? Audrey. So convenient, the microphone was right here. Um, I would say how to do the customer retrofits. Because unless the buildings uh, are retrofitted for free or something close to that, we will not be able to do this in an equitable way. OK, super, thank you. Anyone else have anything else? That, oh, so, so Morgan, and then, yeah. I'm just thinking it will be really important for us to tie in how geothermal network geothermal can the end result can be the most cost-effective uh, pathway to electrification. So there is a lot of academic work taking place out there, That's you know, and there's a lot of planning mm -hmm. uh, for long-term electrification. We need to be pushing for, I think it's efficiency, efficient electrification and how geothermal inserts itself so tidily into that. Okay, so, but in terms of like, okay, and then I In terms of policy. Yeah, okay, so in terms, okay, thank you. And then Jared. Um, I think a common language, right? Because yes, even thank just, you. <laughs> just sitting here now, hearing from multiple people, we're using different terminologies for the same thing. So uh, we should decide upon this common language. And then also um, units of measure that help collapse the understanding. So, so we'll put that in common language, I think. Sure. Unit, common language and units of measure, it would be huge for the whole industry and for everybody working in this. Right. And to the, the get units, along. Of, units of measure is important because then we can collapse the understanding between the electric side and the gas side or the heat side. Yeah. Right. So and that's those units huge. Should that's potentially be like KW like and KWH, and maybe that's it. Yeah. KWs. Okay. All right. And you had a question? A, a, a priority? Well, this is not a priority, but a different way of approach. Um, I'm Anisha Rane Fondakaro, so led solutions. So instead of going for different policies, how about all the geothermal community were nationwide grouped together and do two signature projects, one at state level, one at federal level for state, Let's start with New York State. Build something for legislative office building, LOB, to take care of their all their heat and requirements. So, so have the states be examples. Yes. That's and a then, great idea. And then the... <laughs> That's a great idea, yeah. Uh, and then the Senate, well, in the Washington, D.C. Oh, have it. State uh, there you Capitol. Go. Ryan, we're giving you that for your list. 
the Capitol building. <laughs> yeah. And then we asked those people who work there, how much energy did you save? How much electricity did you save? You tell us about the GHG emissions avoided, yeah. and they'll have to tell the truth. <laughs> and then that would give the well, geothermal community a bargaining point. OK, this has potential. Uh, You'll have zero emissions. So to make you. this happen, these are the various policies, like the entire value chain. Yeah, thank you. No, that makes, that makes sense. There's nothing like leading by example. Um, all right, so yes, um, Peter. Oh, sorry, I haven't seen you. Oh, way in the back, you're next. So, so look at and yeah. I'm sorry, it's it's harder to hear way back here. Um, so you're talking about uh, you, you different need, uh, thermal resource evaluating different thermal resources. You need financial valuation on thermal resources to be incorporated within the network. So if you're extracting heat from a municipally owned resource, what is that going to cost um, the end the end company who is extracting that resource? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Can you add to that? Yeah. yeah, and then and then we're coming back to you, Peter. <laughs> thank you for your comment. I, because this on? Okay. Because yeah. um, thank you for your comment. Because I forgot one thing, which is it would be very helpful to have um, some developed criteria for you know where and how to start building out these um, <clears throat> these networks, and which would involve some mapping, right? So where are the ends of the gas system? Where are the communities that would benefit the most? Where, where does the geology favorable, right? And where, you know, where, so find, so doing some resource maps, including what this gentleman said, but, but sort of hitting a bunch of different, um, criteria, I think is something that would be extremely useful instead of this kind of, um, hodgepodge so, uh, approach we've I'm been gonna, taking it, so far. It's going to go back to the, we need the data to, for site selection and to understand where, you know, what the resources are and how to use the system. And that was the, the panel just before us. So I think I only have time for one more question. Um, Peter, I mean, one more priority, sorry, one more priority, Peter. Yeah, I mean, I think Lisa just mentioned it, but I think like a strategic framework for thinking about how to prioritize and phase in uh, networks in different regions and how to coordinate that with utility and infrastructure planning seems like, I, I think now there's a lot of int you know, interest coming from here and there and things can be happen or not happen, but it's um, to be able to like think about that on a statewide level or larger level and zoom in on first priorities and second priorities would be really valuable. And, and coordination, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, it looks like Angie is waving and jumping up and down and saying one more, please, so. Yeah, I would say the one thing that I think is a top priority that kind of covers everything is equity. You know, as we're thinking about deploying this technology, how are we serving the communities that we're working in, especially those that are disproportionately impacted, frontline communities. So, so you're saying that for every one of these ideas, we should make sure we're including equity as like, how is it, in that should be one of our top priorities, yeah. but yeah, I think that covers a little but, bit of everything. But any priority we work on should include equity. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. That's a great point to end on and a very important point. Um, all right, so now uh, we're really lucky because so, so today the, it's people and policy and New York um, has a great example of people getting together to, to create policy and passing important policy in this area. So I'm going to invite three of the people who made the Utenja bill happen. And so thank you, Jessica and Lisa and Ed, if you could please, if, if here, we're gonna give you um, microphones. We have, I think, yeah, we can just do it up front. Or you guys just can pass, here's the mic. If you could briefly introduce each other and then that would be great. This is Lisa Dix. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica Ashley. <laughs> And this is Ed Draves. <laughs> and Jessica is uh, the fearless leader of Alliance for a Green Economy um, and Renewable Heat Now. Um, and Ed Draves is with Shanker Russell Clark, um, and he represents the, the uh, UA, the pipe fitters, steam fitters, plumbers, and sprinkler fitters. And I'm Lisa Dix, and I am the New York Director of the Building Decarbonization Coalition. 
And we're going to tell the story of how we miraculously got the Utensha built best <laughs> in a Hail Mary at the end of session. Yeah. Do you want to start? You start. Oh. Okay. All right. We'll start. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, as Ed mentioned earlier, we had a really rough and tumble legislative session last year. We had some amazing um, policies for building decarbonization, electrification on the table, the New York State climate plan was in hot debate and under a comment period, and there was a lot of resistance, um, and a lot of people really worried in the labor force about what this was gonna mean for their jobs in the fossil fuel industry. And there were um, labor unions showing up at the hearings and really resisting the proposed climate plan and resisting a lot of the legislation that we had on the table in New York. So, we asked Lisa Dix <laughs> to um, see if she could have a conversation or start some conversations with labor unions to see if we could find some common ground. So do you want to yeah. take it from there? Yeah, and so my background, um, you know, one of the big priorities that I worked in my former job um, as the campaign director for the Beyond Coal campaign in Sierra Club was really building the offshore wind industry in New York. And at the table from the ground floor were labor unions. So um, we built an amazing, it's amazing, <laughs> offshore wind, if anybody wants to see what we're doing here. Um, and really the idea came was, look, you know, we, we really need to like bring everybody to the table from the, you know, you know, on the ground, especially the folks that are gonna be the most impacted. And so what we did was we, we talked to Ed and he can talk about, you know, some of the conversations that we had, you know, to get us there. Um, and we, I really looked at, you know, some of the other groups that had really great relationships with labor unions um, and had a really productive relationship with labor unions. I also want to point out that it was um, during an election year, so that really kind of amped things up. Um, so we were really looking at organizations that specifically had a lot of influence with the legislature right, um, legislators looking for endorsements and these kinds of things because we really needed to get something done at the end of the day. And we also, as um, really trying to keep um, um, equity centered in our work, it was also really thinking about organizations that really could come to the table to think about how we really center um, frontline and underserved communities in what we were trying to do. So we, uh, I uh, pulled together Ed um, and John Murphy because they had uh, really just had a recent conversation, as Ed said, with this lovely man in the audience, Jay Egg, um, Jay, can you from stand Egg up Geo. He really should be up here with us. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, we really just had this amazing conversation, actually. It was like Jay, Jessica, John, Ed, and I. And we really thought of, we, we really decided that we had a lot of commonality and agreement. And where we really agreed is on scale, right? Um, because that is where we're going to create the pipeline for the union jobs and the union workforce. Um, and we also agreed that we needed to do this, meaning electrify the state of New York at scale, right? Because right now our state was doing a, a more house by house approach. It was daunting how much seven over seven million homes that we had to do. Um, and we really had a common thread that we really had a vision around a neighborhood scale. And so we decided, we also started talking about the barriers that we just talked about today, right? And one of the big barriers was that Jessica's organization and so many other grassroots were working in rate case dockets um, in the Public Service Commission where the utilities were actually, you know, not, or where, where the utilities were actually um, proposing thermal energy networks. And what was happening was because of barriers in utility law that are not aligned with the climate law, what we, we, weren't be, we weren't being able to like move these forward, even though the utilities were proposing this. And so we let labor know this, and they said, really? And then we decided, well, let's just write a bill together. And I'll tell, and then I'll let Ed tell the rest of the story in terms of how we, uh, 
um, what we decided on, and then you know they're bringing the utilities into the conversation, and then me and Jessica and others bringing um, environmental organizations, environmental justice organizations, climate justice organizations that also work on both with underserved communities and with local union workforce. So. Uh, Jessica kind of underestimated what the hearings were like. So at these hearings that were in January and February, there'd be 200 of our members screaming outside the hearings at 200 of her members who were screaming back at our members. Um, so it was really ugly out there. I said it was rough and tumble. Yeah, it was rough and tumble. Um, so what we, we sat down, and I have to say that the important thing here is that they understood that every month, our president gets up in front of the members and has to say how many people are working, how many people are not working, what jobs are coming up, and has to say what's going on. And the story was we were not going to do fossil fuel in New York anymore. We had shut down Indian Point. Those are a lot of jobs. And our members get paid month by month. And if you don't work for two months, then you lose your health care benefit. You lose your pension benefit. And you have to travel. So when these jobs go down, they don't build a new peaker plant. 400 guys don't work. And the manager has to stand up and explain that to people. That's a lot. And we had no path forward at this point except to fight. And the utility workers were in the same place. Thermal energy networks gives us the opportunity, especially at scale, to be able to go out and save the utility workers' jobs because the utilities stay in place. And they don't have to worry about their pension and their jobs. We stay working because we're constructing those things. And the jobs that disappeared in fossil and disappear in nuclear are replaced by geo. And the other thing is, is by doing it in scale, and this is really essential too, because somebody talked about equity here. The New York State law says 40% of the benefits of the decarbonization of New York should go to just uh, environmentally impacted communities. We can do that. The labor movement can absorb and bring in apprentices. One of the things that people don't understand is if we don't have jobs, we can't bring in apprenticeships, right? Because we have to have those people working. It does no good to bring in an apprentice and two years into his apprenticeship say there are no jobs. But if we scale and we sequence, we know how many apprentices we need, we know how many journeymen we need, and we can go out and the trade union movement in New York has agreed to do something which is called direct entry, which means we will go into these communities and direct entry apprentices from these communities into our, our jobs. The key being that we have to have the jobs. And this is why U10s are so important to us because you can build them at scale, the utilities can operate them, and we can create a pipeline of jobs for our current members go into the um, diverse communities and bring those members back and do that. And when we saw that opportunity and they understood what our needs and we understood our things, we fight all the time. So like we're sitting at the table and you, <laughs> Jessica heard how much money was in thermal versus nuclear and she turned around, she goes, I can't believe it. And I said, my job, baby. So, um, <laughs> Love you. And she said she still <laughs> loves me. And so we don't agree on everything, but we do agree on the path, uh, that there is a path forward and there's a way to do this equitably. And I think understanding diversity and working together, we went into the legislature and we said, there is not one piece of legislation in this body that is endorsed by these people and these people and these people. Not one thing. There's only one place that there's unanimity and it's here. And we passed both of those, that our pieces basically unanimously and they weren't even written, well I, we always laugh about it. I Memorial Day I was cooking hamburgers and we're writing the bill and my wife is yelling at me to get the hamburgers done and you know, and <laughs> so on Memorial Day we don't have a bill and we had it done by June and now we're on to our second round and we've been negotiating this week and you talked about making government, we're working right now to start studies on 15 campuses for the feasibility of doing thermal energy networks um, and making the state lead on thermal energy. So that's, that's where we are. Yeah.
So I want to just add one thing to Ed's comment that I think that neither one of us really talked about, none of us talked about yet, was that the utilities were a really, the gas utilities were a really important piece of this puzzle. I can't, you know, emphasize enough. And I personally was worried, um, just given how hot everything was last session. And there was also something, a key element here was that we really just had, this was, we, we decided that this might never happen. Um, it might blow up. Um, but what this exercise was, was a, a real building of trust. And if we could work together and build trust through the victories that we were able to get, then maybe we could start to do more things and more things together. So I really want to just make sure that the utilities, you know, got you know some credit there because that was the key, the key, one of the key components besides labor, frontline and environmental justice organizations, the building industry, as well as uh, the environmental community that really got us over the finish line as well at the end of the day. I just want to add one more thing that I think made this bill um, really special and maybe why it passed so fast. I mean, we haven't really said so much about it. passed in the last two days of session, right? Yeah. <laughs> we introduced it about a week before the session. was it was a nail biter. Um, and we had been talking for a while yeah. and really listening to each other. Yeah. And we'd actually been talking about a different bill, um, but we you know, kind of set that aside in order to be able to move forward on something that we could work on together. Um, and we really built that bill together um, with each piece of it touching on something that each of us needed, each of our constituencies and our allies and our coalitions needed to see. And so Lisa calls it, she reminded me, we have to go slow to go fast. <laughs> and I think, you know, it was kind of a slow burn for a little while and then a huge kind of acceleration at the very end. I, I hope you're all super inspired and are go, going to go make this happen in every, wherever you work um, to, to have success stories like this that we can have nationally. And thank you so much to our fabulous panelists. And now we have a list and we'll be reaching out to work with you on the list. Thank you. <laughs>